Okay, welcome to this podcast that's part of our course here at Winchester University in the history and context of journalism, a very broad course in the history of ideas which are influential today. And joining me in the studio today, we have uh, two students on the course uh, from the first year, uh, Andrew and Seb, and also joining me, uh, Brian Thornton, who gave the lecture earlier this afternoon uh, on the topic of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, the reading for this week, that we'll be discussing next week in our small group seminar, uh, is part of Rousseau's book, uh, The Social Contract. So I'm going to start by asking Brian, uh, just to sum up what, what he felt was the most important idea that came across in the lecture today. Um, <clears throat> Rousseau is really influential in two aspects. One is the uh, social contract, uh, and secondly, he was considered the founder of Romanticism. Essentially, Rousseau was anti-Enlightenment. He, he believed that this world, this uh, Newtonian world of measuring things, of quantifying things, of um, putting things in systems, was just wrong, and it, it wasn't the true or full expression of what it meant to be a human being. Um, so that it's a often mistaken feeling that uh, Rousseau is part of the Enlightenment. He he really isn't. He's anti-Enlightenment. And one thing that interest, interested me that you mentioned uh, in the lecture, and I and I've read in in Rousseau's writings, is is this kind of cult of the North American Indian of the of the noble savage. I think that that I, I personally think that helps us understand Rousseau a lot. So can you say a bit more about that? Um, yeah, this is very pertinent with Rousseau um, because, you see, he saw a society as the enemy, as the thing that corrupted um, people's true nature. So a savage, the noble savage, was somebody who was removed from society, who was not corrupted yet, um, who was in, as much as is possible, in a state of nature, in a, in a pure state, somebody who... Um, uh, didn't essentially care about how society viewed him. He acted uh, on his own true instincts. Um, so this this ties us into uh, Rousseau's um, uh, position as founder of Romanticism. He he believed in he he believed in the, the truth of the countryside. He believed in the truth of of rural life, of the poor, of the noble savage, of of people who. Who hadn't entered society and hadn't been hadn't had their heads turned by society. Um, I think you're right. I think that's a good way to think about Rousseau. To think about him as as somebody who was anti-rational, um, who who didn't believe that that uh, that Newton was the pinnacle of humanity. He believed that essentially the noble savage, um, Locke, Locke uh, had had this um, image that a normal labourer, a normal worker in England. Will will have a better house, will have better clothes, and will will, will be better fed than uh, the king, uh, a king of, of a tribe in, in somewhere in America, or, or um, some primitive tribe. Um, but for Rousseau, he, he was completely the opposite. He he believed that um, that that king, that primitive king, was a truer human being, um, was closer to the general will. Uh, than somebody who had been completely corrupted, distorted by uh, by society. To, just to follow that a bit more, and then perhaps we can bring uh, Seb and Andrew into the discussion. <coughs> um, just bringing him up to date and his influence. Um, his liking for the nomads and the uh, the North American Indians reminds me of the kind of dropout idea of the 60s, you know, that people tried to live outside of society in a more sort of natural way, living by their own laws, without a family not indoctrinating their children, rather than allowing their children to, to grow, up, grow up wild. Can we say something a bit about how Rousseau has come in and out of fashion? Because it's a very unfashionable idea at the moment that you should let your children grow up wild and so on. I, I, th I think we're sort of very much in an enlightenment uh, period at the moment. We, it's a lock, is very influential. Um, I mean, think about popular culture. Um, uh, something which is... Uh, emblematic, his iconic of uh, Rousseau's ideas would be uh, John Lennon's Imagine, um, or in from for movies something like Easy Rider, where people um, are existing outside Making society. Their own rules. Exactly, exactly. Born to be wild, born to be free. 
Um, as Rousseau said, people are uh, born free, um, and it's only society that puts them in chains. So it it does come in and out of. It, it's seen as anti-establishment, um, but the 60s was a was a, saw a rebirth in interest in Rousseau, um, and you can you you can see why. One last one before I bring bring them in, but so. In a way, Rousseau is the father of the kind of hippie movement on the one hand, but in your lecture, you, you also said he was the, the father of extreme nationalism, even fascism and uh, even Nazism. So how does that work? Uh, Rousse- Rousseau is a very uh, interesting individual. He was, he was contradictory. He, a lot of his ideas weren't clearly formed. He, his, he didn't come up with any clear... Um, um, Defined clearly defined ideas on what a society should be. He was he was happy to put ideas out, and the the ideas proved to be hugely influential. Somebody so th- we have somebody uh, like Wordsworth Shelley who was influenced by Rousseau, but then we have somebody like Robespierre who was the architect of the the reign of terror in, after the revolution, who was also influenced by uh, Rousseau. Um, there's the idea you mentioned in the lecture of the general will and uh, an influence there on the French Revolution. So suddenly we don't obey the king anymore, but we the people are free. And that gets you, I think you mentioned, into a kind of problem, which is who are are the people? And then that leads you down the road of nationalism and exclusion and all the rest of it. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, in the French Revolution it was seen that the, the, the people were leading the revolution, that this was a revolution of the people, that the... Um, that this was an expression of the of the general will, um, but then the problem is somebody will ask who exactly are the people, um, and in somewhere like France you might you might argue that it was a clearly def- because of its clearly defined boundaries, we know who the French are, um, but it, it starts to get very very complicated as as we move to different countries as we move to different situations, um, and the nationalism I spoke about in the lecture. Was <clears throat> is connected with this general will because it is seen that some leaders, some inspirational leaders, can be seen to have to embody the general will, to make the general will manifest. Um, uh, I spoke about uh, Germany pre World War II um, in the way that um, uh, that the Nazis were seen as as embodying. Um, a sort of a general will, general feelings in society. Okay, Andrew. Uh, um, Brian, do you think that the French Revolution would have happened at all without Rousseau? Do you think it would have um, would have even materialised, or, or without him, do you think it may still have happened, but it would have taken a different course? It's a very difficult one. I would argue, and this is only my opinion, I would argue that it would have happened um, just because of the situation that the country was in. Um, France was uh, a totalitarian state. It was uh, it was run by uh, individuals, by kings, who believed that they were given their power directly by God, um, so that when they when they made uh, decisions, when they made laws, they were speaking with the voice of God. Um, the Catholic Church in France was beyond reproach. Um, the people, the peasantry, were absolutely crushed. Um, they were powerless. They were without any voice. So that this was a pressure cooker, this was just uh, building, 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 building of pressure, and eventually something was going to have to give. Um, the pressure, the steam had been let off in England through the Civil War. Um, the absolute monarchy had been changed into a constitutional monarchy. Um, the parliament um, was becoming supreme. So the steam was, was being let out. Um, but I think that the form that the French Revolution took... Um, 